Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles as a group, as solo artists, past, present, sometimes the future. And welcome to our first show of 2019. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and the former Beatles desk and classical music critic at the New York Times. And I'm here with my regular esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Hello, Ken. Hi, Alan, and uh, Happy New Year to all of our listeners. Hmm. And Darren DeVivo, who is a DJ at WFUV in the New York area. If you haven't heard him or don't live in the New York area, they are available online, so you should check him out. Hello, Darren. Hello. uh, Hello, Alan and Ken, and uh, howdy to everyone out there. Happy New Year, and welcome to our first show of 2019. Okay, so this week we are going to talk about the first of the two or two and a half new McCartney reissues, Wildlife, Red Rose Speedway coming up, and the Live in Europe coming up as well, too. This time it will be just Wildlife, but first we have some news, and I turn you over to Ken. Thank you, Alan. Well, first of all, uh, we have to bring up the brand new song that Paul McCartney gave us as a download on New Year's Eve, and it's called Get Enough. And this song is actually another songwriting collaboration with Ryan Tedder from the band One Republic. And uh, for those of you keeping count, that makes three songs that the two of them have collaborated on as songwriters following Fa You and also the song Nothing for Free, which was a bonus track on the special edition of Paul's album, Egypt Station, made available through Target stores. And Tedder also co-produced the song with Paul and Zach Skelton. And uh, without a doubt, this song online has provoked a lot of controversy, Mm -hmm. uh, certainly because of the heavy use of auto-tune. And um, I know that there are some fans who think that it's one of the worst things Paul's ever done. But it, uh, as usual, you will get a mixed reaction to something like this. But I'm curious to find out from the two of you what you think of the song, and then I'll give you my thoughts. Who should go first? Let's start uh, with Al- Darren. All right. I have to preface this by saying that I am still, probably this will take the rest of my life, to get programmed into the new way that music is released. I live in the rotary phone and toaster of an age, and (laughs) it was about, I would say it was about 1130 New Year's Eve that I was flipping around on Facebook, and I saw several people commenting about talk of there being a new McCartney song coming at midnight. And I needed like a few minutes to figure out what that meant. Gee, wait, how could, I can't get to, how does the record, wait, they don't do records anymore, uh, So I actually almost forgot about it, and uh, the Earth kind of came off its axis a little bit because I downloaded it at about a quarter after 12, and I actually found where it went in my iPad and was able to listen to something that uh, I'm a big physical format guy, so... Yeah. And I have to be honest with you, I didn't listen, you know, great speakers, and it wasn't loud. Put it on, downloaded it, listening to it through the iPad, and I had to shut it off about probably a third of the way through, as soon as the auto-tuning part came in. And I calmly said, without having heard the whole thing, I may have heard the worst thing that Paul McCartney has ever done. And I I posted, uh, I said, some point during the day on New Year's Day on my Facebook page, you know, taking the high road, you know, he's had a brilliant career. He just put out the stinker of his career. And a lot of people did tend to agree with me, but I was also noticing comments of people that liked it, liked it, even a few that liked it a lot. And that encouraged me because I knew that in time, if it's meant for me to like it, I will warm up to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've listened to it just a couple of times since then in its entirety, and my opinion has improved slightly. I still think it could be the worst thing that he's ever released. That's a lot to say on a show that's also dedicated to wildlife. Oh, come on, come on. (laughs) 
I will say this, though. I understand where it's coming from. I get it. Mm-hmm. McCartney is, 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 and he gets points. Everyone has given him points for this. Even those people who were iffy on Egypt Station, don't know if they like Egypt Station, don't like Egypt Station. Virtually everyone is saying he gets points for, at this point in his career, not wanting to sit back on his laurels and past successes and become an oldies act. And he's releasing vital new music, surrounding himself with some of the heavy hitting young producers and writers and musicians. He's not turning into a grumpy old man who is, you know, has turned his back on what's happening today. So, you know, just recent years, as controversial as it was for some McCartney fans, he collaborated with Kanye West. I didn't particularly like what they came out with and didn't quite get what the collaboration was all about. But then again, if memory serves correct, I may have thought the same thing about working with Stevie Wonder and Michael Jackson in the 80s. Now it's Kanye West. Now he's working. He worked with the young producers with the new album. And now on Egypt Station, most of it's produced by Greg Kirsten, although not, as Ken pointed out, not get enough. But what I hear is McCartney... In being influenced from the Kanye West stuff, this sounds to me like a 2019 pop song that a 20-year-old pop or hip-hop musician might have done. But it's like cold water over our heads to hear him using auto-tune uh, in the fashion that it's used in popular music today. We first heard that on, uh, what was that song, Believe from Cher, where auto-tune Ooh. isn't used as a correcting device, it's used as... An effect. So hearing Paul use it as an effect for the first time ever, at a point in the song where you really hear the age in his voice, where those two collide, that was really what derailed me when I heard it. His voice sounds old, and what the heck is he doing with auto tuning? And it was all converged into one moment where I thought, oh no, this is, you know, the worst thing he's done. But again, like I said, its place in McCartney's uh, canon, I understand, and I get it. This is Paul being influenced by contemporary artists and contemporary music. I think if he was working with a producer with a personality like Nigel Godrich's, who produced Chaos and Creation in the Backyard, perhaps they play around with it in the studio and somebody suggests, Paul, don't, you know, that's, this isn't that strong of a tune. It's a track to throw in a box set, not to put as a prominent single on New Year's Day. <laughs> um, but he well, doesn't have that per- person around him telling him no, Paul. So well, this it's, song... It's not a single, really. It's just well, it's a new song that he's released. It's not, it's not intended to be a hit. It's just an extra track that he's put out there as a download only. Yeah, but it, you, that, well, that brings up a debate that we don't have to get into here. What exactly in 2019 is a single? It has a cover... You have cover art, which you could see. So that could very easily have been a 7-inch vinyl single or a CD single. I viewed it as being both an outtake and his new single. Yeah, it was promoted um, as a single. Really? It, to me, it was a fact so. that should be on the last extra disc of the deluxe box set, if there is one. I don't think releasing it prominently on New Year's Day... And it, it did kind of appear here as Paul's new single. You'll hear his, his aging voice and auto-tuning <laughs> crashing together. And it's going to jar many of you. But uh, again, like I said, McCartney here working with these young musicians, contemporary artists. This is him af- being affected by, uh, affected, being influenced by the Kanye Wests, hmm. the Greg Kirstens, etc., you know, let's put auto tuning on this tune. Mm. Alan, what oh, do you think? Okay, uh, I, I don't think I hated it as much as Darren did, um, <laughs> believe it or not. But there were a couple of things. I mean, yeah, like Darren. I mean, you can. I, I think anybody could see what this was, that it's him trying to do a contemporary sound and he can do a contemporary sound. I don't think it's so much a matter of influenced by Kanye as trying to do something that it would appeal to 
Kanye's fans, if he still has any, or and people that age. So, I mean, influenced by, I mean, we may be talking semantics here, but so he was influenced by, you know, Carl Perkins, and he was influenced by Little Richard. I don't think he's influenced by Kanye. I think he's looking at what Kanye does and says, I can do that, because he can do quite a lot. There was something else that, that Darren said about, you know, he doesn't want to rest on his laurels and wants to do what's happening now. And really my response to that, just in general, not even with regard to this particular track, is that his laurels are quite considerable and he should rest on them because it's the best stuff that's ever been done. And what's happening now is rubbish. So why would you want to, when you have those laurels to rest on, want to rest on the trash heap? It doesn't make any sense to me. Now, that said, about this song, I mean, yeah, the auto-tune was, I think it's used so much that it's like you can't miss it. I, I do think that at the root of it, he needed to use the auto-tune the way auto-tune was invented to be used, and I think that they also just decided to use it as an effect, as a, a subsequent idea. I could be wrong, but maybe it's that, you know, when they did the auto-tune on the vocal to tune it, it was apparent that it was auto-tuned, so maybe they decided to just use it in such a radical way that it would that there'd be no question of people sitting there saying, oh, I think he's using auto-tune. Yeah, he's definitely using auto-tune. He's using it as an effect. Okay, fine. People using auto-tune as an effect, one of the many things I don't like about contemporary pop. I refer you to what I just said about a minute ago about it. <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of catchy in the way that some of the other things on Egypt Station were. I mean, it's an outtake from Egypt Station. I think one of the things that people were saying on the internet uh, when it came out was that maybe this is really a teaser for that big deluxe Egypt Station that he was talking about a few months ago Well, when, when the record came out. And I, I don't know. It, it, it I've heard much, much worse from him. Uh, I don't like the effects. The, the song isn't much, but it's catchy. And uh, that's basically, I've listened to it maybe three times, and uh, that's about it. I'm not sure when the next time will be. But um, yeah, so that's sort of, I don't know how you would characterize that. It's a, a lukewarm, don't entirely hate it review. Hmm. So over well, to Ken. <laughs> my opinion is a little bit better than yours, Alan. Okay. But first of all, where autotune is concerned, I've gone on record here on this show saying that I hate autotune. But I, what I should clarify is that I, I hate autotune when it's used for people that can't sing and hold notes. Right. You know, uh, I don't mind when it's used as an effect. And as a matter of fact, um, on the other talk show that, that I'm a part of, the solo Beatle talk show called Talk More Talk, I mentioned the Cher song as well, Darren, because on that particular song, which I believe is one of the earliest examples that was used of autotune, but certainly it was used for effect. And I think that really helped the record sell. OK, I, yeah, I, I don't mind autotune when it was used on nothing for free. I absolutely love that song to death. And I didn't mind when it was used on for you. But this song, I just think, is not that great a song in terms of. Uh, I don't think it's that melodic to begin with. I do think the lyrics are very strong. Hmm. But in terms of the melody, it just doesn't stick out at me. So it's not like it's something that I see lasting, at least not for now. I've listened to the song. I've given it a good 10 listens at this point. And um, there's no telling how I might feel about this song in the future. But I, uh, I'm not agreeing with the point of view of what you were saying, Alan, about this being... You know what some of this stuff is the worst thing you know it, it's it's part of the garbage that's out today because i don't think anybody knows when they create any music whether it's going to be lasting you know the beatles certainly didn't know when they were creating their music in the 60s that this was something that was going to be played 50 years later and opinions about all music can change you know there may be certain albums that you didn't like in the past that suddenly you like so much more now and I don't know how I'm going to feel about this song 10 years from now. 
So I try to leave myself open-minded to that. And certainly in the case of Egypt Station, which I think is a wonderful album, there's, uh, you know, some songs that sound very contemporary and some that sound like traditional Paul. Mm -hmm. And I think that Paul likes to experiment. And I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily Kanye West influencing, like you said, Alan. I just think that um, he doesn't do anything unless he really wants to do it. And when it comes to putting out music that sounds contemporary for its time, he dabbles in that. He doesn't do too much of it. And usually, whenever he does try to do something like that, like Press to Play, which is a, an album which is very controversial with Beatle fans, some of them can't stand it because some feel it's drenched in the 80s sound. I happen to love that album. I've never changed my opinion about that album. Mm -hmm. He's done dance music, which I'm sure some, some Beatle fans don't really care for. That would be me. But every... Yes, and uh, and I love when he does that. In most cases, I, I like most of what he's done. But this is one example where I think it's an okay song. I don't hate it, and I wish that Paul would just do whatever he feels like doing without worrying what the public might think or whether it goes with his image. If he happens to like this kind of music, if he wants to use auto-tune, I think he used way too much in the song, it wasn't applied as much in the other two Ryan Tedder songs. But um, if he wants to do that, he should do whatever he wants to. That's the sign of a true artist, an artist who does what he wants. you know. And it just so happens that McCartney is one of the most commercial songwriters of all time. So it may sound like he's always trying to have a hit. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he should ever have that mindset today because I don't think he truly understands radio and how it works because the stations that play the songs that are hit singles are not going to play him at all. Even if he put out Band on the Run today, they wouldn't play him. So I don't think Paul realizes that. You know, you even see sometimes when he's in the process of making a new album and he's talking to people like Ryan Tedder and uh, Greg Kirsten, and they're kind of privately saying, you know, make me some hits. He's not going to get airplay on that kind of format of radio. He gets airplay, minimal airplay, with his new releases on rock radio, primarily what, what's called AAA, the AAA format of radio. And that's it. And then his very loyal fans go out and buy his records. And that's how his records sell. And the reason why Egypt Station went to number one is because of all the publicity and all the promoting that was done behind it. Mm -hmm. He made the public aware that it was out there, so he got his loyal fan base to buy it, and maybe some new ones along the way. But um, radio is, is not going to be that receptive. They haven't been to anything brand new from him. He gets very little airplay. So he shouldn't have that kind of a mindset that he's going to have a hit. You know, I mean, he had four or five seconds as a hit, but that was primarily because Kanye West and Rihanna were on it. <laughs> you know, And those are the artists that will get airplay today on that format of radio but um i don't object to this song coming out at any time that paul does something that he feels like doing which may sound contemporary for its time and folks auto-tune is nothing new you know it's been around since at least the time of the share record so that's 20 years ago so but anytime he does something like this and does something that he feels like doing regardless of what the public might think i applaud him for that you know what? I applaud him when he does whatever he wants, regardless of what the public might think, and it's something adventurous and good and and interesting. When he's just sort of chasing after a hit, doing stuff that, I mean, I have a real hard time thinking that the guy who wrote Yesterday, Here, There, and Everywhere, and a whole, not just drawer full, but like a bureau full of other absolutely top drawer stuff can listen to this stuff that's going on and say yeah that's good i want to do that i mean I, it's it's just like the disco stuff from from the 80s you know through Oue le soleil and uh, even coming up all of that stuff i i don't know i mean maybe he likes coming up he sure puts it in his concerts a lot or or did for a very long time but you know i yeah he doesn't he doesn't have to worry about what people think but he does because he wants to have hits and i think that 
you know, okay, when during the Beatles years, they wanted to have hits too. And he and John wrote very commercial stuff and competed with each other for the A-side and, and the whole thing. But, but that was a different time. They've now, you know, they now are the Beatles, you know, or were, and don't have to say, I wonder what kind of sound is going to be a hit now. You know, you should just, as you say, do what he wants, but, but, you know, really this chasing after the, the latest fad is just kind of, you know, they made the fads back in those days. They didn't chase Ooh. after them. Now he's chasing after them. It's a little, it strikes me as undignified. Well, that's a very good point that you made there, Alan, but I still think that Paul wouldn't release this stuff unless he really wanted to. Yeah, could be. He uh, has I, the final I, say on everything. Nobody's dictating to him that he has to do this. So he is doing in the moment what he wants to put out. Hmm. I would like to believe that McCartney doesn't seriously think that any, and this is no knock on his material, that McCartney's produced something that's going to literally become a hit. I think it's a figure of speech today. A hit Egypt station was a hit album. Was it a hit album if it came out in the 70s? No, it was a bomb, commercially speaking. But a hit today, number one album, hey, it's a hit. You know what I mean? It doesn't necessarily mean it's a charting single like the definition, uh, the literal definition would be. So I don't think he's chasing after or has, has any illusion that he could have a hit today. But I think he wants to be... He said it in the 60 Minutes interview that he has insecurities. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to him to not be an old grandpa musician, uh, uh, to be a, 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 an important musician today whose mute work is relevant. And, you know, a little bit, he's going with the times here and, and, and testing out the trends and dipping his toe in this. And maybe he won't do a song like Get Enough Again been there done that for him you let's move on but in the meantime he has released this song and when i when i said he was influenced by kanye west i kind of used kanye as an example for the uh, this entire contemporary pop scene that he uh, has embraced he's embraced it he's always been kind of into what what's a hit at the time he's got his kids his grandkids mm -hmm. playing him all this music it's seeping into his head why not mess around in the studio play around some auto tune on this extra track that he has and maybe we could put it out the thing is that he gets the points from me as i said before for you know trying new things we'll leave it at that and but and this has been the case with paul for his almost all of his post beatles career paul needs to have somebody at his side to say no and only on a couple of uh, instances did he did he have uh, that person because a no, you know, go ahead and make a song like Good, Get Enough. We'll put it out, like I said before, as an extra track at the end of the big deluxe set. But no, Paul, don't put it out prominently. This is not a strong piece of music, you know. And if you want it to be, let's work on it better. Let's get rid of the auto-tune. Let's put the auto-tune on something like Caesar Rock that is kind of a kind of freewheeling, loose song. Uh, we'll use it over here, or let's try it in this way. And I, you know, I, I tried thinking what other tracks would I think uh, were Paul's worst. There is a worst song in there. Every artist has it, and every artist has a best. And I couldn't help that. I could make a case for even things like Party Party and Bogey Music. That oh, <laughs> I like those songs more than I like Get Enough. <laughs> I, I love Bogey Music. I love Bogey Music. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that would be one that that's an easy target. But I said, no, I, I like bogey music uh, actually much better than Get Enough. But like we've said, we said this with the Egypt Station show. Egypt Station is going to grow on us. We all agreed with that. Our opinions will probably change. If we did an Egypt Station show in June, I bet you we have different things to say about it than we did in September. I know it's clicking with me. It took a couple of months, but it's really clicking with me now. And I always think back to how, as, as a 15-year-old, I reacted to hearing McCartney 2 for the first time. I cried. Huh. I thought he lost it. I, I couldn't. It, what, what is that? Today, mm -hmm. I know it's, it's, it's a small piece in his catalog, but I enjoy it and I get it totally now. Um, okay. So 
I think Get Enough has its spot in his discography, but when the dust settles, it also, in my opinion, could very well be the worst song he's released. Okay. And the effects okay, so help it. We so we've done now about a little more than twenty five minutes on this one track, and we still need to talk about his other worst work. Um, so oh no! Don't no, no, say no. that bit like bop. it's a sad. bit bop, That's, bit bop, uh, bit bop. Uh, 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 <laughs> no, no. Just, hey, diddle. Okay, well, it's interesting being <laughs> it's interesting being um, outnumbered on that one because everyone else I know pretty much agrees with me on this. Anyway, shall we anyway, continue with the other news I, items? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Paul gave an interview to BBC Radio Scotland in which he said he often reforms the Beatles in his dreams. As he admits his sadness over the loss of John and George, he said, John and George are still a big part of my life, always will be. I often think about them with a lot of sadness because they should still be here. John's case, it was a terrible thing. In George's case, a terrible illness. Paul, his wife Nancy, and family members... Uh, were seen currently vacationing in St. Bart's. They were swimming, they were shopping, and Paul sent, uh, spent some time with American record executive L.A. Reid. Uh, in recent years, Paul has been giving his fans a little treat now and then uh, by issuing free downloads on his website, uh, material not on his recent remastered series. And such is the case at Christmas time. Paul made available what is called his orchestra up version of the song Dear Friend from the Wildlife album, and also a different take, take two of Hands of Love. Have either of you heard the downloads? Oh, yeah. No, I haven't. Okay, Alan, what did you think? Remember, toaster oven and rotary phone. That's not the land I live in. So I will listen to them, but I haven't. Alan? Um, well, I think, you know, really for... For this show, uh, since we're doing wildlife, I focused more on Dear Boy. I listened to the other one a, a few times, but I figured we would get to that when we got to Red Rose Speedway. And I, I really like this take of this mix of Dear Boy. Um, Dear Friend. We, I really like this mix of Dear Friend. <laughs> Because I, I think the orchestration is kind of interesting. Uh, the orchestration is, I think, Richard Hewson, who... Yep had done uh the orchestra well he did all the stuff on thrillington and um that going was him back to uh Mary Hopkins. he he right well going back further than that he orchestrated long and winding road which is what i always find kind of fascinating about paul using richard hewson all the time because he loathed long and winding road i mean he's made quite a point of how much he he was upset by that and hewson was the orchestrator but apparently yeah. he's just holding it i guess against specter not against hewson um because he's used hewson a lot and he does good work um yeah so uh i i, I like this i i'm not crazy about the the sax solo seems a little more expansive to me and it's that kind of period of saxophone writing that was on the closing credits of every movie of that era but nevertheless the rest of the orchestration i really kind of like and uh and i think it, it i'm not sure i would say it was better than the one he put on the album possibly um but uh it's it's a close contender and you're talking yeah. about dear friend right yeah. dear friend yep. right okay right. yeah i i kind of agree with you um, I like hearing all these different versions, although I'm kind of dear friended out at this point with all these different versions that have come out. Right. But um, the saxes do come in uh, early in the song, and it sounds like there's woodwinds in there, like clarinets, mm -hmm. I believe. Might be a little bit too much orchestration. I kind of like the version, the way that it came out on the album. Mm -hmm. A little more it restrained, has, restrained yeah, orchestration. I, yeah. And Hands of Love, to me, really sounded like the same take. It's just that it went on longer and there's more vocal ad-libs at the end. Mm -hmm. Did you feel that way? Yeah. Yeah, to me it seemed less of a, a, a big deal. Although, you know, it, it would be interesting actually if he put out the full versions of all the songs in that medley. I mean, maybe that would have been... We might have thought differently about the medley as a whole. Oh, I think it's a masterpiece, but we'll talk about that during Red Rose Speedway. Mm -hmm. 
I think the medley was just perfect the way that it was. Hmm. But anyway, for anyone that doesn't know, if you go to Paul's website, paulmccartney.com, he has a page there with free downloads. And he's kept his older downloads on the page, too. So if you're just going to it now and you enter your email address, you can get all the other ones. And there's a there's a great demo of Back on My Feet mm-hmm. on there, Ooh. all just on piano. There are demos for this one, Distractions, uh, Rock Show. There's a different take. And these are all ones that weren't on the reissues. So I love the fact that he's doing this. Anyway, in other news... So, Kenny, think, Kenny, are you saying that there is hope for those of us in the rotary phone and toaster oven land? Uh, we can, we can most catch people. up with our downloads? <laughs> for most people. I have right. a feeling you might be lagging behind, though. <laughs> There's a brand new issue of People magazine just out. It's dedicated to the Beatles in celebration of their 55th anniversary of their arrival in America. The magazine editor for American Theater, Rob Weinert Kent, writes in the forward, thanks to generations of new fans joining the still devout baby boomer Beatle maniacs, the band is bigger now than it was during the Beatles' meteoric decade-long career. Hmm. The 96-page special edition also includes scenes from the group's early years, from their debut on the Ed Sullivan Show, to the mass hysteria that ensued during the 65 concert at Shea Stadium. You can also read about the Beatles' early lives and how they each began their musical careers. I also want to make mention of the fact that uh, Mike McCartney, Paul's brother, celebrated his 75th birthday, and he has been talking about the McGear album coming out next month, an expanded edition with bonus tracks, a deluxe vinyl version, a booklet to go with it, and there's no definite date at the moment, but that's something that we will look forward to here. There's one major passing that I'd like to take note of, and that is of Dean Ford, Mm. who was the lead singer for the Scottish group Marmalade. And um, a lot of fans know them for their big hit here in the U.S. called Reflections of My Life, Mm -hmm. which was a great melodic pop song. But they do have a Beatle connection because they scored a number one hit in the U.K. in 1969 with their version of Oh Blah Dee Oh Blah Da. Mm -hmm. This is what I call a G-rated version of the song because they wouldn't use the word bra when they (laughs) sang the song. (laughs) They sang, oh, blah, dee, oh, blah, da, life goes on, whoa. So uh, check that out. It was a number one hit in the UK for Marmalade. But uh, definitely Reflections on My Life, great pop song right great there. Song. One of the first songs that impacted me as a kid, and I had the 45. I can say this, that a couple of things, just to just feed off what you pointed out. It appears that the real Mike McCartney is on Facebook now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he may have just la- uh, you know launched the page, and I'm happy to say I'm Facebook friends with him. Uh, and he has so on, that, on that page, he's alluded again, he, like you said, he's talking about McGear. And if I'm not mistaken, this is the first time mm-hmm. McGear will be available. I could be wrong, though. This could be the first uh, time it's been available since Ryko Disc released it. In the 90s on CD, mm-hmm. uh, it's at least the most recent. That's the copy I have, the only copy of McGear. And right. as for Dean Ford, uh, a guy who works very closely with uh, the Joey Mullen slash Bad Ki- Badfinger Camp, Dan Matavina. Um, evidently, I don't know if he managed Dean Ford, but he is on Facebook uh, praising, plugging. Uh, the fact that Dean Ford cut a solo album that came out just a couple of months back, I believe. And it sounds like a tragic life. He had his personal demons. He did one solo album that Alan Parsons produced after Marmalade broke up mm-hmm. or after he left Marmalade. That ended up being the only solo album he did until the last few years. Uh, and I think he was just released two. And uh, if you dig around on Facebook and Look for uh, Bad Finger Pages or Dan Manavina. Uh, you'll be able to find information on these recent releases from Dean Ford, uh, whose daughter lives in the New York metropolitan area. And uh, I just think one of those great, uh, great bands out of the late 60s, Beatleish pop bands that uh, mm-hmm. no one knows about or they've forgotten about. Or And he had a great voice, Dean Ford. Yeah, we so, should definitely investigate their material. 
Okay, so shall we get on to the spectacular <laughs> wildlife album? I, if you I want to put it that way. And <laughs> well, Ken didn't like it. the way I put it before, so I thought I'd try something else. Okay, go ahead. So we have this reissued deluxe wildlife album, which has not only the album, but rough mixes of a number of the tracks. In fact, actually rough mixes of just about all the tracks, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, a disc of bonus audio, which includes the uh, what used to be in the bootleg days uh, of Paul and Linda running through a bunch of things, including Good Rockin' Tonight, Bip Bop, Hey Diddle, um, She Got It Good, and I Am Your Singer, and then a bunch of outtakes and demos and things. So there are two demos of Dear Friend, um, which... I think is what Ken was alluding to before with all of these dear friends kicking around an outtake of, uh, I think a demo really of indeed I do. Okay. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. I, I don't know. Mm. Uh, when the wind is blowing, which I don't believe I'd heard before. Uh, oh, that's, that's been around a while. actually. Except there's uh, a bit I, of it in the Kanye song, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll talk about that because that song has a long history behind it. Right. Okay. Uh, the Great Cock and Seagull Race, which has been around for a while. It was um, actually recorded originally during the, a CBS interview, I believe. And when that interview got passed around in the bootleg world um, in varying degrees of quality, that was one of the sort of takeaways from it. You know, you could get that track. Uh, so here it is now officially. Uh, then he fills out the second disc with both sides of the Give Ireland Back to the Irish single, single edit of Love is Strange, and then a an interesting little jam track, uh, African Yeah Yeah, which if you just let it play out, there's a brief gap, and then a bit of When the Saints Go Marching In that morphs into something else that's hard to tell what it is. I suspect that that is Paul playing trumpet on When the Saints is. Does it? Does it? I didn't notice anything in the book mentioning it, but um, mm, it, I didn't it, see that in the credits. It could be in the credits at the end. I, I didn't scan them for that, but uh, but but we know that that was one of the songs he used to play when he played trumpet. You know, mm -hmm. so it's it's it, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, maybe during one of the orchestral sessions with uh, Mr. Hewson. Uh, he borrowed a trumpet from someone and played and the tape was running and they just sort of jammed a bit. So, um, you know, Wildlife was the first Wings album, uh, really the, the third post-Beatles McCartney album, if you don't count Family Way. And it, it, it came, I, re I remember when it came out, it, it was a little surprising to a lot of us. But um, Darren, why don't you why don't you tell us a bit about the album's history and what he had in mind? Well, um, like you say, if you don't count the Family Way soundtrack, Wildlife is Paul's third post-Beatles album and Wings' debut. Paul had released McCartney first, of course. His first solo album was a homemade uh, record. Most of it done literally at home and finished up then at Abbey Road. And uh, it kind of had a little bit of a theme in there of, physically being home and with family, with loved ones, and he really emphasized that more with Ram, which came second, which he gave Linda equal billing. Ram was done in the studio with studio musicians and recorded in New York, so it was the exact opposite of McCartney. And in a way, both those worlds merged with the debut album from Wings, Wildlife. Paul announced Wings' formation uh, in, in, I believe it was August, 71, uh, it went public, had a launch party for the band. And I've always said that, you know, and, I, and I'm pretty confident that this was probably how, what he was thinking. He, had, he did his, his therapeutic first album at home, McCartney. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He then did Ram, came out of his shell, went to New York, uh, brought in musicians to play with, enjoyed the experience of working with other musicians. He's always, he always had the bug that he liked playing live, and he wanted the Beatles to resume live performance. And he found himself, hey, I'm Paul McCartney, the solo artist. I don't want to be a solo artist. All I've known is being in a band. I want to play live. I don't want to play as Paul with hired guns. 
we'll put an all-star band concept type thing together and have egos of these established stars. I want to go back and I want to make, I want to form the quarry men too. Mm -hmm. And that's what he did with wildlife. Uh, I'm sorry, with wings. And he went to the people he worked with on Ram, Denny Sywell. Hey, you want to play drums in my band? You're forming a band? Yeah. Wings. Sure. But um, the guitarist said no. Hugh McCracken and Dave Spinoza. I think Spinoza was approached. I know Hugh McCracken was, and he McCracken, turned down. McCracken oh. was. Um, Spinoza oh. wasn't. He sort of ducked out early in the Ram sessions. Ultimately, Paul rang up Denny Lane, uh, original member of the Moody Blues. And Denny came in, and Wings were born. Paul, Linda. Linda was learning the basics handle some basic keyboard parts in the band and harmonies. Denny would play guitar, Denny Lane, Denny Sywell on drums, and Paul had his early 70s version of The Quarrymen. And uh, they did it, you know, they lived together for a little bit, hung out at Paul's farm, jammed, went into the studio to record this first album. Paul wanted it done quick. He was influenced by how Dylan used to hammer out albums in a matter of days. They spent less than a week i think at abbey road uh recording an album to me three days life, it was actually what? three so the main tracking was done in three days, three days. yeah and um, J- to me wildlife musically is mccartney and it's done at abbey road so it was executed like ram was in which was recorded i believe at cbs studios in new york mm-hmm. so it's home meets the studio and there's lots of when the album finally came out on Apple on December 7th, 1971, you heard a very rough and raw band, possibly not totally polished, uh, but still feeling their way around. And uh, some people, I guess Alan, doesn't like the roughness and other uh, and the looseness the sloppiness and the mistakes that pop up in wildlife while others find it incredibly charming like me and I'm assuming Ken, um, Mm -hmm. you know, in the same way that McCartney fans hold the McCartney album near and dear to their hearts. uh, In a way, wildlife holds that same, same meaning for, for all of us. Let me see what else here was the first thing from wings. There weren't any singles released from the album, although Love is Strange almost came out. Like the McCartney album, Wildlife had no singles. There weren't any, as there were strong songs on Wildlife, but there weren't any true radio hits, like Maybe I'm Amazed. And as a result of that, and the fact that perhaps some people didn't know McCartney had formed a band, the cover of the album didn't say anything on it, Wildlife only reached number 10 on the U.S. charts, and number 10 for McCartney was, for lack of a better word, a flop. Mm-hmm. Especially since McCartney topped out at one and Ram reached number two on the mm-hmm. charts. Uh, wildlife topping out at 10 was a big disappointment. Uh, but as I said, probably because there weren't any singles, it wasn't an easy album for radio. And, you know, there wasn't a Maybe I'm Amazed on the album. And perhaps a lot of people even then didn't yet know that Wings was a band with a Beatle in it. I find it interesting that Alan Parsons worked on the album because it is sort of a rough sounding record. And here we are now in, well, now it's 2019, but on the anniversary of the album's release, December 7th, 2018, a deluxe box set came out of Wildlife. And we know there's a Red Rose Speedway box and there's the other box. We'll get to that maybe in the next show. But uh on the anniversary of its release, Wildlife lives again here in the 21st century, and uh, I'm thrilled. Okay, Ken, do you want to comment? Uh, well, Wildlife is an album that, uh, when it first came out, I was very much attracted to a few songs in particular. Uh, Tomorrow always mm-hmm. leaped out at me. Some people never know. I always loved and uh, I always enjoyed the version of Love is Strange mm-hmm. and I uh, thought it was pretty interesting that here's uh, a reggae arrangement of that song. And as the years have gone on, I've really grown to really love this album overall. 
The problem with me is that I like most of what McCartney's done in his solo career. And if you're going to judge albums by what's the best and what's the worst, even the ones that are at the bottom of the barrel have so much good material to me. And, you know, I love the simplicity, the rawness of this album. And I do think that, and this could be another topic for uh, another show, we are living in a time when I think that people really like simple production. This album has kind of a garage band sound to it, mm -hmm. and that's very appealing in this day and age. And that's why we like to hear stripped down versions of songs that had orchestration. Like it's, it's wonderful to hear Dear Friend with just Paul on the piano and nothing else. In fact, the, um, the early mix of Dear Friend is just Paul and Denny Sywell on drums, not hearing any orchestra. Uh, you know, Red Rose Speedway box has Live and Let Die, just the band without an orchestra. It's exciting to hear that. It, um, you know, you have John and Yoko's Double Fantasy as a stripped down album. You've got outtakes of Beatles and solo material that's stripped down. And people like that a lot more now than I think they ever have before. Some people really prefer that type of production. I think so in this day and age more than the polished stuff. You know, I know a lot of fans that would prefer the 70s McCartney in terms of production. I'm only talking about production as opposed to a tug of war album, which to me is a masterpiece as an album. But I'm only talking in terms of the actual sound. OK, so I happen to like the fact that this album came out at a time when Paul was just creating a brand new band from scratch. It's a fascinating thing to study. I mean, while we have a documentary like Wingspan, they could make a documentary about the very beginning of a band whose leader came from the biggest band in the world. And what do you do with that band? How do you follow the Beatles? And um, they just took the approach that this is who we are, warts and all, no big polish to this album. I think it took a lot of guts for Paul to put out an album like this. And um, as I said in my other talk show, if I had a band of my own, I wouldn't start the band with an album like this. Mm -hmm. just, just so raw and uh, being so well known for well-produced albums like Abbey Road or Sgt. Pepper and coming out with something like this. But in this day and age, I think a lot of people find this very appealing. And there's so much that I like about this album. It does have a lot of variety in it. It's got incredible vocals from Paul. The title track to Wildlife, his vocals on Tomorrow, especially the, um, the coda of the song um, i love his throaty vocals on on mumbo you know it's just a fun track that's just a jam and i could listen to paul do that kind of stuff for you know 10 minutes <laughs> a 10 minute track like that so uh you know i really enjoy the album now it might be lower on my list of all the mccartney albums but i appreciate that album more now than i ever have in fact david frick who wrote the uh the essay or the book that accompanies the box set, really, uh, he says that the sound is very contemporary today, you know, and people are looking at it now in a new way. And I, I think if people, uh, especially the old fans, a lot of them will, will appreciate the album more now than they did before. And probably a lot of new fans, if they listen to this, would like it because it sounds very, very contemporary. It doesn't, it doesn't have auto-tune. <laughs> yeah. oh, All right, there's a plus for many people. Yep. <laughs> Sounds before, contemporary, but doesn't have auto tune. Okay. Before before uh, you, you uh, give your opinion, Alan, you brought out a good point, Ken. It's interesting that McCartney and Wildlife, two of his first three releases after the Beatles, were very were the complete opposite of the Grand Abbey Road. Right. So you know, putting out Wildlife as the first album for your new band was a ballsy move less than two years earlier he also mccartney was a ballsy first solo step true uh, but so Good alan point. your uh, wild life thoughts okay well this may surprise you but um I've, <laughs> I've gotten to like it a little more listening to the reissue partly because the the sound is really much better than any of the other versions that I had. Um, and so even in a song like Bip Bop, there's a lot of texture that you didn't get before. But 
but real and and there are some songs that I really kind of like. I mean, I think Tomorrow could have been a single. Uh, Darren was saying, you know, there was nothing particularly like Maybe I'm Amazed. Maybe it's not up to Maybe I'm Amazed, but it's it's a good song. Um, I think it possibly could have used a bit more polish, like everything on the album. I understand the whole the whole idea of wanting to go in with a band and just sort of put out an unpolished album just to sort of show you know, the sort of gritty beginnings of the band. You know, if you were a normal band, you know, that hadn't had a member that was in the Beatles and could therefore pretty much dictate his terms, even at that point, you wouldn't be allowed to make an album like this. I mean, if, if any of us went in with the band and played exactly this music, a record company would say, well, you know, go home and practice for a while. Um, They hadn't been playing together an awful lot. Uh, Mumbo, you know, Mumbo has a really good groove uh, and he's shouting something, which is part of the really good groove. But you look in the book for wildlife to see what they give as lyrics and it says ad lib. I can't understand what he's singing, so I, that's why I looked it up. Um, it's mumbo. It's mumbo. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess he's doing so one of those sort of cod vocals that he sometimes would do, and and it, it you know, it, it 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 fits the mood of the song, but it is by definition really to the degree that it is a song at all because it's jam. Um, it's an unfinished song, you know. It, it it's. It's not ready for prime time. Bit bop. Well, you, you could have an instrumental. That's a song. A song doesn't have to have lyrics. Right. But if you're going to be shouting something, that kind of suggests almost that you intend for there to be lyrics. You just haven't written them yet. And then uh, let's just put it out as it is. Mm. Mumbo always struck me as a jam session. And I always listened to Wildlife when Mumbo was on as the band getting started, warming up, jamming, Mm -hmm. and let's put it at the beginning of the album, again, harking back to McCartney in the same way the lovely Linda was Paul testing the machines out. Right, but he had a song. And And let's put this little half-written ditty at the beginning of the kick the album off with it. To me, Mumbo, I could be wrong. I always thought Mumbo was a jam. It is a a jam. jam It is a jam. Um, Made up on the spot. There are no words, so, you know. Right. Okay. Um, <laughs> then there's Bitbop. That's not really much of a song either. In fact, you know, he's talked about how it's just something that Mary liked. And so he put it on and, you know, worked up the band arrangement and, and did it because it was something Mary went around the house singing. Now, Mary gets a bad rap for an awful lot of his questionable stuff. An awful lot meaning also Mary had a little lamb. So, Bitbop, okay, maybe it's Mary's fault. We can say that. I mean, I don't know. I don't think Bitbop is really much of a song. Love is Strange is a cover. Uh, Their version of it is kind of charismatic. I will agree with that. Wildlife, I kind of like the idea of, you know, we saw a sign in an African uh, uh, wildlife reservation about the animals have the right of way, all that stuff. It's kind of interesting. You know, he talks in the David Frick essay in the book about how he doesn't like things being too cute. If you don't like things being too cute, you don't sing a line like the aminals in the zoo. OK, that's, that's just I'm, I'm just saying. OK, so that's wildlife. Uh, I'm your singer. Not too bad. Uh, again, could be more polished, could be more finished. Bip Bop Link doesn't count in the same way Mumbo Link doesn't count because we've already dealt with them. Tomorrow, as, as I said, probably the best song on here as a song, although Dear Friend is up there too. And that's it. That's those. So we got basically two pretty good songs, a jam, a not very good song, a cover, you know, and... You, well, you missed my all, you, you said a cover as though that's a bad thing. Well, it's it's a unique arrangement. It given, is. Uh, it is. And 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 I don't I don't absolutely hate it. <laughs> well, thank you. 
<laughs> well, Ken, I was wondering, you know, if, if Wildlife is not his worst album, what is? Well, I wouldn't say worst. I'd probably say least favorite for me would probably be McCartney, too. But hmm. then there's a lot of there's a lot of songs on that album that I like. Hmm. Okay. You, and then you, you did not mention my favorite song from Wildlife. Some people yeah. never know. Some people never know. I think I mentioned it, didn't I? Did you, uh, to me, that's no. that that tomorrow and and uh, and like you said, I am your singer. You singled out tomorrow was your favorite track. If those songs had a little polish on them and were released maybe a couple of years later, they'd be significant song tracks. I think. Well, I mean, the thing is, if they were recorded a couple of months later, they probably would have had them finished, you know, polished. Mm-hmm. And um, but again, that part of the appeal of this album is the fact that it's not polished. Yeah. Right. Well, okay, it's part of the appeal for people who find it charming that he put out an unpolished album as his group's first disc, and it's part of the whatever the opposite of appeal is for the rest of us. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, come on, you're Paul McCartney. Get an album together, you know, practice. <laughs> well, he had these these moments as, uh, you know, dotting his career, you know, these trite, you know, some people might consider them trite moments. Uh, McCartney actually would fall on that. And now Wildlife and McCartney, too. You know, my least favorite McCartney album is Give My Regards to Broad Street. Mm-hmm. I always thought the Pre- uh, Pipes of Peace was a very... Was uh, was also one of his weakest. Uh, he's got these moments that are very lightweight in his catalog, and perhaps for some, wildlife belongs there. I uh, wildlife wasn't my first McCartney album. My first was probably Red Rose Speedway, which we'll talk about in the next show because that's the other Wings album that got reissued as a deluxe box set along with Wildlife, and I had Red Rose Speedway on cassette probably when I was around eight or nine years old, got banned on the run on cassette around the same time. And, and, um, and then my copy was an apple of wildlife. So um, I got it probably in the 75 ish range. And those three albums, maybe along with Venus and Mars, those are the real soundtrack to me coming of age. I turned 10 in 1975 and all of these songs and all of these albums mean so much to me. A right down to Bip Bop, which I always liked. Maybe might have been my favorite song on the album when I was a kid when I first heard it. Hmm. Um, so this is a very sweet, you know, examination. This box set is an examination of this album in this era for McCartney and uh, and for Wings. Okay. <laughs> well, it's wonderful to know that Wildlife has some fans. Well, you know, the thing is, when you explore Paul's entire catalog. You've got such variety there, not only in terms of all the different musical styles that he's worked on, but the different ways he's produced records. And there'll always be those people that that prefer the raw, the unpolished, and then there are some that prefer the polished. And so it's it's fun to go back and forth and find out different opinions. I like the fact that we have this this variety and so many choices. Mm-hmm. to pick from it's like some people love the russian album because it's very loose you know it's not a polished well, it's, record it's not as but loose as this i don't mind this at all i think it works for what he was doing at that time and i still think i love the arrangements just the way they are you know when you listen to the rough mixes of wildlife mm-hmm. you also realize that he made some wise decisions for the final mix mm-hmm. you know so there was some thought, some effort put behind the final mix of all these songs. So um, I just love the fact that you have so many choices within this vast catalog of Paul McCartney's. And I have found that there are a lot of fans now that really prefer the early McCartney stuff. And they'll always be the ones that like from the 80s on up. But there's always going to be those fans, even pre-band on the run. For some of them, there's nothing like the early McCartney. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, especially all the acoustic stuff he was doing. I mean, you can you can take Bip Bop and Hey Diddle and put that in the same category as Heart of the Country and a lot of the acoustic stuff he did on the first McCartney album. And they love that sound and that time. And there's nothing quite like that for some people. 
just like the acoustic stuff he did on the White Album, for that for that matter. <laughs> it harkens back to that. It reminds people of that, and some people prefer that time. Whereas he I, could do a, he could do a mashup and come up with bit diddle. Um, <laughs> Um, okay, so now we, we, we know where we each come out on uh, wildlife itself. Um, just looking at the box, I think, you know, as a reissue, it's really very well done. Um, we get the four discs in a folder. We get two books. One is a reproduction of um, Linda's notebook from the time, which is kind of interesting. It, um, it has a lot of the lyrics, some of the lyrics still being worked out. It's got you know, chord diagrams for guitar. She must have been learning guitar as well. I thought she had come to this already able to play the guitar. And I have heard her play guitar, actually. In 1989, when they were going to go on tour, there was a little press round table at the Lyceum Theater the, the day before the big press conference at the Lyceum Theater. And they came out, Linda picked up a Stratocaster and started playing it. Paul was on drums Wix, I think, was on bass. I mean, everybody was playing an instrument that isn't what they play on stage, and they did kind of a reggae jam. It, it was really not too bad. Uh, mm. Yeah, so so there's that in that book. It's, uh, you know, very fascinating to see someone's notebook. You know, you're not really originally intended to see it. It wasn't made for public consumption, but you can learn a lot about, you know, what they were doing at the time. And there's the video, the video I, I was a little disappointed by. Uh, there is the 1971 Scotland tape, which has been out on bootleg, um, both audio and video. Uh, and here it's, you know, we have the audio separately and the video. I'm not sure what the point of that was. Um, hmm. I, I kind of, you know, once you've got the video, you already have the audio. So why have it again as just audio? since it's a significant part of the bonus audio disc. It also has, uh, the second item is the ball, which was the basically the release party for wildlife with uh, Paul's hand-drawn invitations, I think which is included in a reproduction in the set. Um, and it's just video of celebrities coming in and, you know, Paul talking to people. It's... It's, you know, it's not that interesting. It's like watching your bar mitzvah movie, you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> there is a snippet, meaning roughly, I think, 20 minutes from the ICA rehearsals. Now, the ICA rehearsals were filmed. ICA is a, a sort of a big auditorium in London where Wings got together to rehearse actually after the album, before right before they recorded, uh, and I think while they were recording, Give Ireland Back to the Irish. And also when Henry McCulloch had just joined the band, it really was the Henry break-in rehearsals in a way. Uh, and the whole film is uh, about 90 minutes long, and it's out there. It's very hard to find. It doesn't circulate generally. I'm not sure why they picked only 20 minutes or these 20 minutes. Uh, it's a reasonably representative 20 minutes, but, uh, you know, it just gives you, a, a, I, guess a, I guess he just wanted to give you a little taste of Wings rehearsing at that period, but not the whole thing. Uh, and then we get uh, Give Ireland Back to the Irish, another rehearsal, and I think that was also from that CBS television interview. And it's not quite the finished version it's 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 getting there uh it's kind of if you like it rough and unpolished that's that's the version for you uh and that's in it fact, mm -hmm. in fact paul paul doesn't even sing into a microphone yeah yeah i think they're in this living room i, I think that's cavendish avenue probably right i'm not sure yeah i, I can have to look that up I think the uh, the CBS crew came and interviewed him at home. I'm I'm not sure. Uh, I think that's what what it was. Uh, but so that's the video, and it's not an awful lot of video compared with what we're going to get in Red Rose Speedway, which is plenty. So that's that's the the box as it is. Uh, can you have anything to add? Well, you really summarized it very well. I would just say that I think that it's a, it's a wonderful box set. 
It's beautifully done in terms of the packaging. I do love the book that comes with the box set that um, David Frick wrote the story of Wings in there. So a few things I didn't know about the history of Wings. Uh, like, for example, I don't know if you caught this, but um, after Hugh McCracken turned down uh, being in the band, it does say in here that Paul was considering having Joe Cocker as a member. Yeah, that it, didn't make any sense to me. I, I mean, yeah. I mean, you think of him strictly as a singer. Yeah. So, and ironically, he ended up getting someone from Joe Cocker's Grease Band. Mm -hmm. So, and also there's there's some articles that appeared in the newspapers about reviews of wildlife and also at the very beginning of Wings. Mm -hmm. There was talk about, I think it's in the NME, that Paul is about to form a new band called the Paul McCartney Blues Band. <laughs> I love seeing stuff like that. And the photos in here are just absolutely wonderful. I mean, there's so many photos that you haven't seen before and a lot of outtakes for what could have been the front cover of the Wildlife album. Mm -hmm. So yeah. kudos on a, a really wonderful book. And like you were mentioning, the, uh, the diary, Linda's diary, I do love looking at handwritten lyrics. I do think that some of these are actually Paul's handwriting. I don't could think be. it's all Linda's because I noticed mm -hmm. the lyrics of Suicide mm -hmm. are in here and um, also Womankind mm. as well. But uh, yeah, it's got the chords to the songs and it's just very interesting. The set lists for their shows. It's great to have that. You have the actual invitation for the, um, the launch of the Wildlife album at the ball, at the venue that uh, was called the ball where that was done. Um, and there's also a whole set of Polaroid shots which was really cool to put into this box set. You could take them out. You could blow them up yourselves, mm -hmm. you know, and it's, it's a, a wonderful touch. Where this box set falls short to me is in the bonus material. I just don't think there's enough of it. And I do love the, uh, the bonus disc of outtakes. Um, I just don't think that there's enough unreleased songs there. Like you were saying, they repeat the songs from, uh, the farm in Scotland, the acoustic stuff with Paul and Linda for some reason. And maybe it's just my ears give Ireland back to the Irish sounds so muddy still whenever I hear it on CD. Yes. So, Alan, Alan, Ken, I'm glad you pointed that out. That struck me odd. It, it sounded and the, the instrumental version, the B side also. Yeah. It, um, you know, sounded pretty muddy to this day. The best version I've heard of give Ireland back to the Irish is my vinyl 45 of it. <laughs> hmm. It's it's much brighter. It's got a lot more punch to it. It's nice to have the single edit of Love is Strange. Uh, when the Wind is Blowing, we should just talk briefly about that song because it has a long history to it. And Paul has told this story before, and it's in the book, that when uh, Linda was pregnant with Mary, after she gave birth and Linda was in the hospital, Paul was hanging around for a while, and he was looking at a painting. It was a Pablo Picasso painting of a man playing a guitar, and he noticed that he was uh, using two fingers to play a chord. And Paul decided he would try and figure out what chord that was. And so he imitated what the, the guitar player was playing. He got that chord and he built the song around moving his fingers around two fingers at a time to come up with ability. So he came up with that song, When the Wind is Blowing, and um, didn't release it at the time. And if you look at some of the bootlegs for the Rupert the Bear full-length feature film, it was proposed for that film. Oh, yeah. And then when he started working with Kanye West, he whistled the melody to him. And unbeknownst to Paul, somebody recorded it and then put it into the record for all day, the Kanye West single. And it was, if you listen towards the end of that single, you will hear that whistling. And it's taken from this song. So this dates all the way back. This song goes back to 1970. So, and it's a beautiful melody. It really I thought it was gorgeous. Yeah, I love that. I kind of wish that Paul had, had written some lyrics for it. Mm -hmm. all I, can't, I, can't, I, I, could, I can't help but picture that he got done listening to Sergio Mendez before uh, <laughs> he recorded that, because it has that kind of cool, sexy, yeah. jazzy thing going on. But it is interesting that he used the Picasso painting as an inspiration to write a song. So uh, I used to have a poster of that painting on my wall in when I was in college. You know the painting, right? It's kind of yeah. very, very bluish. Yeah. 
It's a famous. Isn't it called Blue Guitar? I think it's That's called it, the Blind. Old Guitarist. I'd have to look it up. It's in the book, but um, it, it still is a wonderful box set. I just wish that, like some of Paul's archive series, he is kind of skimpy on the bonus material. Unlike Red Rose Speedway, mm-hmm. which we'll talk about in our next show. Well, also, you know, on, on the bonus audio disc, he's got these outtake one, outtake two, outtake three. And what they are are like 12 seconds of him playing a, a you know, a, a rock riff, you know, mm-hmm. uh, or a couple of chords on an acoustic guitar. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, this is the stuff that really belongs to be on bootlegs, you know, for, you know, us to say, oh, well, this, you know, this is great. It's it's on bootleg. We haven't heard this before. But to release it commercially, I don't know. It just seems like, what, what's the point? Yeah. And, you know, I happen to like those two instrumental tracks on Wildlife, the album, the Bip Bop Link and Mumbo Link. Mm-hmm. But at least they're close to a minute long. You know, it's a memorable thing that he's playing on the on the guitar there. These are just, uh, yeah. you know, just a few seconds of him coming up with something. I, it has no substance. Mm-hmm. I don't understand why it's on there. But. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My, uh, my opinion of the box set in a nutshell is similar to what you just said, Ken. And this has been a beef that uh, many folks have had about past box sets that Paul has put out. There could be more. Uh, you get the sampling, like uh, Alan was pointing out about the ICA rehearsals. You get mm-hmm. a sampling of it. Well, in these box sets, especially for what we pay, how about the whole thing? Yeah. Um, I'm sure there were more outtakes or combined things. I thought it was weird to have Give Ireland Back to the Irish and the instrumental B-side tacked on to to the end of a CD that had a bunch of previously unavailable odds and ends and home recordings maybe this could have been condensed by a disc the price dropped a bit uh well, i just that's think something, that's something that paul has been doing on most of his archive series when it comes to the outtakes he includes songs that were singles a sides and b sides he tacks them on there in addition to the unreleased outtakes and i, I kind of d- wish that you know it, it's like padding yeah, I, I think I think I like give Ireland back to the Irish is kind of tossed on at the end. Maybe what you could have done is give us give Ireland back to the Irish and the B side, put them on bonus tracks of disc one with the remastered album. Maybe he could have combined the remastered album with the rough mix. That's almost like having wildlife twice in this box set because the rough mix disc, which is disc two, is the album, almost all of the album rough mixes of the tracks and and the album itself is almost like a rough mix <laughs> the finished product so it's like repeating yeah uh, i i just think that he if he maybe could have put both of those on disc one uh and given us more substance or reduced the price with a less with one less disc you know i'm thinking like with the, with the the way um the beach boys catalog came out on cd you get the mono mix you get the stereo mix it's one disc Mm-hmm. Right. You know, and maybe disc one could have been the remastered original album and then the rough mix mm-hmm. uh, all on that one disc and then right. give us disc two of bonus tracks and then maybe a third disc with a presentation of of Give Ireland Back to the Irish, you know, in another place. It just seems like Give Ireland Back to the Irish got tossed on at the end and it gets lost amongst all of these home recordings and 10 second outtakes that or on the third disc. Yeah, really, uh, if you move Give Ireland Back to the Irish and Love is Strange onto the Rough Mixes disc, which kind of makes sense in a way, uh, and then got rid of the stuff from the film, uh, you'd have very little left on the bonus audio disc, and he would have to come up with something extra. And there's, you know, there's stuff from this period. Uh and also the video, as you say. I mean, it's we 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 really should have had the whole ICA tape, but um, yeah, yeah, it's it it it. You're both right. I mean, the 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 arrangement of the material is a little skimpy in a way because of the way it's 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 arranged on the discs. And 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 in fact, you know, I mean, disc one, 
just the wildlife album i un- i can understand his point of view of okay the album itself should have its own disc but then you have to say well why because a lot of these are going to end up on an itunes playlist anyway and go play all three of the audio discs in a row without a break and that's just the way it's going to get listened to so why is it that important to have the album on its own with no extra stuff Mm -hmm. you know the Mm -hmm. single the singles could have been on the end of that too um you know, CD bonus tracks, like the way uh, the McCartney catalog was reissued in yeah. in Europe in the early 90s, the Paul McCartney right. Right. series. Mm-hmm. You got the album, you got a 10-second gap, which they actually told you there mm-hmm. is a 10-second gap. Yep. And then you get the relevant, in most cases, singles, A's and B-sides. Yeah. You know, And that way, give Ireland back to the Irish, which I would have put on Red Rose Speedway, but that's me. Because of the presence of Denny, uh, uh, Henry McCullough, and it's 72, which is largely Red Row Speedway territory. I just think that putting uh, Give Ireland Back to the Irish and the uh, single edit of Love is Strange at the end of the third disc, it, it gets lost. And I think it could have been, it, skimpy is a good word, and it could have been arranged better, This uh, the audio portion of the box set. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And also, I should point out, and you actually were mentioning this, Darren, the rough mixes. I enjoy them, but in many cases, there aren't too many differences between that and the finished product. And some of them, it, when you do have a difference, it's like it, it kind of leaps out at you because there's so few differences. And uh, like in the case of some people never know, you actually have uh, some trumpet playing in there, for example. And uh you don't have a guitar solo where there was supposed to be one. So, you know, I enjoy hearing any differences in these takes, but there aren't too many of them on the rough mixes. Yeah, like Mumbo, for example, that's the version on the album, except you could tell there was some edits made. Well, no, I think... And he doesn't say take it, Tony, on the rough mix. (laughs) And and that decision was a good decision to to go back and and mix that in. You know, that, that kind of that kind of helps uh, promote this idea that, hey, we're, you know, we're just in the middle of a jam, turn on the tape recorder, you know? I, I think that this rough mix of Mumbo has the original vocals from Paul with some extra vocals from another take. Hmm. It doesn't sound exactly the same. I don't think so. I Am Your Singer, to me, is exactly the same. Wildlife sounds the same to me. Yeah. You know, See, some people never did, know. But I, I got to listen again. You know, and tomorrow is is only interesting because there's one point where Linda is singing the word tomorrow, you know, and an in, uh, a point in the song leading into a bridge right. that wasn't in the finished version, and it doesn't have the um, what would you call them? Are they arpeggios, Alan? You know, the part that that Paul sings, no, 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 that part. Yeah, you know that that wasn't in the song originally, so it's just nice to know in the very beginning that that part hadn't been thought of. Mm-hmm. You know, so any slight difference I find really fascinating, but there aren't too many differences. Yeah. All right. Okay, so there we have a uh, an overview of Wildlife. I'm uh, outvoted two to one on whether it's a good album, and uh, that's fine. Uh, so let's give our contact information, and starting with Darren. All right. Uh, Let me just reveal one secret to those folks listening. Uh, We did not use any auto-tuning on this show. (laughs) This is what we sound like. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, it hasn't gone through post-production yet. You never know. (laughs) You don't know what I might be doing to this this show (laughs) there, Darren. Um, uh, You can reach me at my WFUV email address. It's DarrenDeVivo at WFUV.org. D A R R E N D E V I V O. Uh, and as for WFUV, New York City is where we're located, 90.7 FM in the tri state area. You can hear it uh, or listen online at WFUV.org or stream, uh, well, you stream us on the website. We also have an app. And interestingly enough, it's called the WFUV app. Um, and you can listen uh, that way. And go to Facebook, and you can like my Facebook page. 
I ask you to go to the page named Darren DeVivo on WFUV Radio. And uh, not my personal page, but it's best to go to the radio page uh, to be in contact with me. Next. Hey, Ken. <laughs> uh, you could reach me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. My website is KenMichaelsRadio.com. I want to make two quick plugs here. A couple weeks ago, I interviewed Denny Sywell, and we did talk about wildlife and Medrose Speedway and the new box set. And Denny, uh, in recent years, formed a new jazz combo called the Denny Sywell Trio. And a few months ago, they put out a brand new album called Boomerang. Which, which I, I now love. You've heard it. I have it. I love it. Okay, cool. Um, there's a brand new version of Live and Let Die that they've done on the album, and I'm giving that away as part of my weekly Beatles trivia and games. So just go to the page for that. And also, starting this Friday, which is uh, January the 11th, brand new special contest. I have a couple copies of Ken Womack's new book. It's actually part two on the history and life of George Martin called Sound Pictures. It's a contest that will last for a full week. So if you want to win a copy of that book, just go to my website. And on the home page, there'll be a link right to my special contest page as well. So and uh, if you can, check out the solo Beatles video cast, Talk More Talk, every other Monday night on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We just did a show on wildlife and the new box set. So if you're like Alan and you can't get enough of wildlife, <laughs> that uh, what I would suggest is for you to go and check out the show on Facebook. We're also on YouTube and Podbean, just the audio, and we're all over the place. So that would be it. Okay, and you can reach me on Facebook at Alan Cozen or my alter ego, Alan Cozen Remixed. You can contact all of us or any of us at the show's email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at, at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page, which is things we said today, Beatles radio fans on Facebook. So for Darren DeVivo and Ken Michaels, I'm Alan Cozen saying thank you for listening, and we will catch you next time. Take care. But then you have to say, well, why? Because a lot of these are going to end up on an iTunes playlist anyway and go play all three of the audio discs in a row without a break. And that's just the way it's going to get listened to. So why is it that important to have the album on its own with no extra stuff? Mm -hmm. You know, the mm -hmm. single, the singles could have been on the end of that, too. Um, you know, CD bonus tracks, like the way uh, the McCartney catalog was reissued in yeah. in Europe in the early 90s, the Paul McCartney right. Right. series. Mm -hmm. You got the album, you got a 10-second gap, which they actually told you there mm -hmm. is a 10-second gap. Yep. And then you get the relevant, in most cases, singles, A's and B-sides. Yeah. You know, and that way, give Ireland back to the Irish, which I would have put on Red Rose Speedway, but that's me because of the presence of Denny, uh, uh, Henry McCullough, and it's 72, which is largely Red Row Speedway territory. I just think that putting uh, Give Ireland Back to the Irish and the uh, single edit of Love is Strange, at the end of the third disc, it, it gets lost. And I think it could have been, it, skimpy is a good word, and it could have been arranged better, This uh, the audio portion of the box set. <laughs> Yeah. And also, I should point out, and you actually were mentioning this, Darren, the rough mixes, I enjoy them. But in many cases, there aren't too many differences between that and the finished product. And some of them, it, when you do have a difference, it's like it, it kind of leaps out at you because there's so few differences. And uh, like in the case of some people never know, 
you actually have uh, some trumpet playing in there, for example, and uh, you don't have a guitar solo where there was supposed to be one. So, you know, I enjoy hearing any differences in these takes, but there aren't too many of them on the rough mixes. Yeah, you know? like Mumbo, for example, that's the version on the album, except you could tell there was some edits made. Well, no, I and think... He, and he doesn't say take it, Tony, on the rough mix. Yeah. <laughs> and and, uh, and that decision so. was a good decision to, to go back and, and mix that in. You know, that that kind of, that kind of helps uh, promote this idea that, hey, we're, you know, we're just in the middle of a jam, turn on the tape recorder. You know, I, I think that this rough mix of Mumbo has the original vocals from Paul with some extra vocals from another take. Hmm. It doesn't sound exactly the same. I don't think so. I Am Your Singer, to me, is exactly the same. Wildlife sounds the same to me. Yeah. You know, See, some people Mumbo never did, know. But I, I got to listen again. Yeah. You know? And Tomorrow is, is only interesting because there's one point where Linda is singing the word Tomorrow. You know, and in, uh, a point in the song leading into a bridge right. that wasn't in the finished version, and it doesn't have the um, what would you call them? Are they arpeggios, Alan? They, you know, the part that that Paul sings, no, 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 that part. Yeah, you know that that wasn't in the song originally. So it's just nice to know in the very beginning that that part hadn't been thought of. Mm -hmm. You know, so any slight difference I find really fascinating, but there aren't too many differences. Yeah. All right. Okay, so there we have a uh, an overview of Wildlife. I'm uh, outvoted two to one on whether it's a good album, and uh, that's fine. Uh, so let's give our contact information, and starting with Darren. All right. Uh, let me just reveal one secret to those folks listening. Uh, we did not use any auto-tuning on this show. <laughs> this is what we sound like. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it hasn't gone can... through post-production yet. You never know. <laughs> oh. You don't know what I might be doing to this, <laughs> to this show there, Darren. Um, uh, you can reach me at my WFUV email address. It's Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. D-A-R-R-E-N-D-E-V-I-V-O. Uh, and as for WFUV, New York City is where we're located, 90.7 FM in the tri-state area. You can hear it uh, or listen online at WFUV.org or stream uh, Well, you stream us on the website. We also have an app. And interestingly enough, it's called the WFUV app. Um, and you can listen uh, that way and go to Facebook and you can like my Facebook page. I ask you to go to the page named Darren DeVivo on WFUV radio and uh, not my personal page, but it's best to go to the radio page uh, to be in contact with me. Next. Hey, Ken. <laughs> uh, you can reach me at my email address, which is every little thing at att.net. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. I want to make two quick plugs here. A couple weeks ago, I interviewed Denny Sywell. And we did talk about wildlife from Medrose Speedway and the new box set. And Denny, uh, in recent years, formed a new jazz combo called the Denny Sywell Trio. And a few months ago, they put out a brand new album called Boomerang. Which, which I now love. You've heard it. I have it. I love it. Okay, cool. Um, there's a brand new version of Live and Let Die that they've done on the album. And I'm giving that away as part of my weekly Beatles trivia and games. So just go to the page for that. And also, starting this Friday, which is uh, January the 11th, brand new special contest. I have a couple copies of Ken Womack's new book. It's actually part two on the history and life of George Martin called Sound Pictures. It's a contest that will last for a full week. So if you want to win a copy of that book, just go to my website. And on the home page, there'll be a link right to my special contest page as well. So, and uh, if you can, check out the Solo Beatles video cast, Talk More Talk, every other Monday night on our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a Solo Beatles video cast. We just did a show on wildlife and the new box set. So if you're like Alan and you can't get enough of wildlife, <laughs> then uh, what I would suggest is for you to go and check out the show on Facebook 
We're also on YouTube and Podbean, just the audio, and we're all over the place. So that would be it. Okay, and you can reach me on Facebook at Alan Cozen or my alter ego, Alan Cozen Remixed. You can contact all of us or any of us at the show's email address, which is things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at, at things we said fab. And we have a Facebook page, which is Things We Said Today, Beatles Radio Fans on Facebook. So, for Darren DeVivo and Ken Michaels, I'm Alan Cozen saying thank you for listening, and we will catch you next time. Take care. <laughs>